Hello everyone, this is Aurora with Central Coast Astronomical Society. Hello and welcome to our stargazing session tonight. I am so excited you're going to be joining with us. We are going to get started. I know I'm a little early, but for those of you who are early birds, welcome. We are going to have an extra special event for you because this is the last one we're doing until um, the end of summer. So we have some extra special fun things we're going to be doing. Um, the first thing is, have you downloaded your handout? If you don't have this you and you would like it, there is um, a link right below this video where you joined and you'll be able to download that handout. You can print it out. If you don't have a way to do that, don't worry. You don't need this. It's, it's just a little something that's extra just for you before we get started. And um, I just wanted to introduce myself as well as our team. So we have with us, um, so my name is Aurora with Central Coast. I'm the president of Central Coast Astronomical. And also tonight we have uh, several astronomers. You're going to get to meet Kent. He is our main astronomer for tonight. You also get to meet Brian and because the sun is still up we're not gonna be able to do live telescope views Brian was actually thinking about doing a view of the sun but <laughs> it just didn't work out and we will be doing that but we're actually gonna set up special telescopes for that um, but uh, so we uh, you'll be able to meet Brian as well we have several astronomers that are on tonight that will be answering your questions so at any time if you have a question during our presentation you'll just type it in the comments or you can send us an email there is a, a link at the bottom do you see it if you have questions you can text the, uh, that number don't call Call it it won't work you <laughs> just for texting in case you're watching us on something that doesn't have the ability to leave comments um, or you can email us at questions at centralcoastastronomy.org and we'd be happy to answer those questions as well but the easiest way is uh, honestly through the comment box that that is with this YouTube live stream stream because we have several astronomers that are also on and they will be busily answering your questions as we go through our evening together all right so you guys excited <laughs> I know I am too summer is the season that just says stargazing the loudest doesn't it so even if you don't own a telescope if all you've got is your naked eyes no problem you're in the right place our goal for you tonight is to be able to go outside look up know where to look and know what you're looking at and so you'll be able to do that just with your naked eyes if you have just a regular old pair of binoculars they don't have to be anything special grab those when you go outside and we will be showing you which ones you'll be able to look at with binoculars to see even more detail and we do have a few telescope views for those of you who would like a little bit more of a challenge we'll be throwing those your way as well and so I'm excited for us to get started before we do I actually have a special guest who's going to be joining us he's going to give us a four minute maybe five depending on how long he talks for <laughs> a presentation on, um, on one of the objects that he actually took an image of he is an incredible astrophotographer and I am so excited that he uh, <laughs> that we actually have him uh, as well as our main show so we can really tap into the resources of the astronomers around us but he has this incredible observatory and he goes out and he takes these incredible images and we let him know what we're going to be talking about the next month and then he'll say oh okay I'll, I'll go get those images for you and so he put together um, a, a series of slides that he wants to share with you so we're going to do that before we actually start our main show so are you ready for that okay so he is actually from Riverside astronomical and let me see if I can get get his slides up here to help share um, and his name is Alex so Alex are you there Alex yeah yeah I'm, I'm here Aurora. hi Alex um, it's really good to be back tonight because I want to tell you a really good story about M56 it's a globular cluster and it's an alien Ooh. globular cluster that invaded the Milky Way what? A glob invaded the Milky Way eight <laughs> billion years ago. Tell me about it. It's easy enough to find. Go out and look at the eastern sky, and you'll see out there, well, you won't see all these pretty animals and birds and things, because that's just for the planetarium program. And you won't see the lines. But look for this particular bright star, Vega, and these four stars here. They will be pointing to this area of the sky. And as you zoom in, with your binoculars, you'll see a little something. And then finally, with the big scope, you'll see enough that you can see the globular cluster itself right here. With a good 8-inch or bigger telescope, you can see the individual stars and maybe a little bit of the color in oh, some wow. of the stars. Uh -huh. But in order to really get the color, you need to take a long time exposure uh, with a camera. And this is what M56 looks like. 
well. Wow. If you have a space telescope at your command, you can get even more. Check this out. Huh. This is a beautiful picture of M56 taken from the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see that there are hundreds of thousands of stars. If you were living on a planet around one of these stars, it would probably never get really dark because these stars are only about maybe a light year away or a light year and a half away from each other. As opposed to in the Milky Way where stars are about four to six light years away from each other in general. Some facts about the globular cluster M56. Messier first discovered it in 1779, and, but it was just a fuzzy blob to him. It took Herschel five years to look at it again with a bigger, better telescope and find out that there were individual stars in it. It's not all that bright at magnitude 8.3, and the light from that uh, globular has been coming to us for 33,000 years. From one side of the glob to the other is about 84 light years. That makes it about 8.8 .8 arc minutes across. Remember, the moon is about 30 arc minutes across, so this is maybe one-fourth the size of the moon. There's the mass of about 230,000 suns in the globular cluster altogether. And this is only about one of maybe 150 or more uh, globular clusters in the Milky Way. They're made up of hydrogen and helium and not much else. But M56 has even got more hydrogen and helium than most of the globular clusters in the Milky Way. And you'll notice that in this picture, there are many, many other stars. These, all these other stars mm -hmm. out here yeah. do not belong to the globular cluster. They just happen to be visible because the globular cluster M56 is in the plane of the Milky Way. This is where as we're looking towards the Milky Way, we see all of these other stars. But they're in the Milky Way here, right? In front of or behind M56. That makes sense. Now, because of the hydrogen and helium content of these stars, scientists have figured out that this globular cluster is about 13.7 billion years old, which is interesting because the Milky Way, they figure, is only about 13.5. So this thing is probably older than the Milky Way itself. Another thing they found out is that it's retrograde orbit. That means it's going the opposite direction from what most of the stars in the Milky Way are going in their rotation. Um, let's look at some of these things because this is what we're talking about when we're talking about alien. Um, you see, this is the pattern of most of the globular clusters. Oh, wow. They go up and above and below, yeah. above and below uh -huh. the plane of the Milky Way. But as you saw in the picture, M56 is in this plane. It's in this line across here. So that makes it different. And it's in a retrograde orbit. Nearly everything in the Milky Way goes around this way except for M56 and a few other objects that go around that way. What? Now, why would everything go one way except for these few items? You tell me. So here's a picture of something that's happening right now. It's M51, what it looks like today. And that's about what the Milky Way and what we call the Sausage Galaxy looked like about 8 billion years ago. This dwarf galaxy is going to bump into this big galaxy here. When this kind of a collision takes place, the dwarf adds to and changes the big galaxy by making the central bulge grow, by making lots more stars with the added material, and bringing lots more metals into the big galaxy. In addition, all the stars of the little galaxy become part of the big galaxy. The Milky Way in this 8 billion years ago picked up eight globular clusters, one of which was M56, and it picked up thousands of stars. This was because an alien had invaded the Milky Way. <laughs> this is a graph of what the Gaia Space Telescope can tell us. 
you can see that most of the matter in the galactic disk spins a given way at about a given speed. But there is an area that takes the shape of what they call a sausage, although it's no sausage I've ever eaten. <laughs> and it does the opposite. It goes the other way, spins at a different speed. This is the Gaia sausage. Huh. Wow. So, this beautiful object right here yeah. is an alien. But like all aliens, it has made the Milky Way better, and it makes us better. So we can celebrate it. <laughs> and that, Aurora, is my story about the alien glob <laughs> that invaded the Milky Way. I hope you guys all enjoyed that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. If you guys enjoyed that, just drop Alex a little comment in, in the box so he knows if you enjoyed his presentation. So, But thank you, Alex, for sharing your expertise and your beautiful images and made it really easy to understand. All right, you guys ready for our main show? So that was our little pre-show before we started. <laughs> All right, so my name is Aurora. Welcome to the Central Coast Astronomical Society, where we are going to show you not only where to look outside, but what you're looking at. So at the end of tonight's show, you'll be able to step outside, look up, know where to go, and be able to look with your naked eyes. Or if you just have a regular old pair of binoculars, you can bring those out with you as well. And so a lot of this stuff is going to be naked eye or plain binoculars. We will have a couple of um, objects that we're going to cover that are um, also telescope, just if you want a little bit more of a challenge. Okay, so for tonight's presentation, we have astronomers all over the place. We just heard for one of them. You're also going to meet another astronomer. His name is Brian. I'm going to bring him on in just a minute. And then we're going to have our main show. Before I start, did you get your handout? Did you get this? <laughs> Kent and I put this together. Uh, Kent, Brian, and I put this together. This is for you. It's a PDF that is a right around the video that where you click to join tonight's presentation. If you don't have this, don't worry about it. The, you can print it out anytime. On the back are equipment recommendations. So if you're wondering, hey, I'd like to get a telescope or what kind of binoculars should I get? These are recommendations to consider. So please do make good use of the information we put together for you. Also, take a pencil right now and write right across it. See that phone number that's at the bottom? You can text your questions at any time to that phone number if you are um, able to if, if you're not able to leave a comment you can also email us your question at questions at centralcoastastronomy.org that phone number is going to go away we're not going to leave it up the whole time because we want to take the whole screen full of stars so go ahead and write that down write it right across your handout because I forgot to put it on and go ahead and write that down I will read it twice in case it's too small for you to see it's 805-242-6415 805-242-6415 Fifteen one five. Okay, got it? Or you can send us an email, or the easiest way is just to type in the comments. And right now, I'm just going to tell you, there are astronomers on right now answering the questions as they come along. First question that I'd like you to answer for me, where in the world are you? <laughs> this will help us when we do our show. So if you can go ahead and tell us where you are connecting from, that will help us out as we start to talk about objects and we can also talk about things depending on where you're on the planet, your sky is going to look different. Now, we aren't doing live presentations of, or <laughs> This is live. Uh, we're not going to be doing live telescope views because in where we are right now, the sun is still up. So we're going to continue. We're going to take a break from those live views and we're going to continue those when the, the sun goes to sleep a lot earlier in the night. So in fall and winter, we'll be doing some live live telescope views as we're doing these, this presentation. But for summer, especially so near the solstice, it's just, it, instead of keeping you up really, really late, we decided just to keep the show the same and we'll do the views next time. All right. One more handout. Do you have one of these? These are free. Go to skymaps.com, skymaps.com, and print this out for your hemisphere, northern or southern, totally your choice. And these can be a little tricky to use. The way you're supposed to use them is you put them overhead, and this is what you're going to see projected on the night sky. Just line up the north, south, east, west bits uh, so it makes sense. Also, on the back is what's up tonight, or what's up this month that you should be looking at. So the guy that puts those together does an outstanding job and he gives them away for free. Um, how I like to use these with our presentation is to get a highlighter out and highlight and circle things as we go along. And so you can remember, because we're going to cover quite a bit. And when you go outside, you can say, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, we were in this area. Where was that again? Where was M13, M56, M57? Oh, yeah, it's right there. So just write right on it. Um, the other thing is you can take me with you 
when we're done. So you can replay this and just shut off the video, but have the audio going and I will walk you through what we just did again. So you can rewatch this over and over, but you don't want the screen on necessarily when you're stargazing. So just have the audio on and that's another way you can use this resource. Okay, you guys ready? All right, Brian, we are gonna bring you on first. Brian, hello. Let me see if I can find you. There you are. Yes, hello. Hello, hello Brian. <laughs> All right, Brian. So who are you and what's CCAS? Hi. Yeah, so I'm uh, Brian Cox, and I am with Central Coast Astronomical Society as well. And if you'd like to visit our website, you could do that anytime with our full name, centralcoastastronomy.org. And I'd like to also be sure everyone knows that we actually have another event coming up in just a few days. On June 15th, which will be Tuesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time, we're going to have a live moon tour. Now, uh, because the, for the moon, we don't have to have it completely dark. The plan is that I will show a live view of the moon, and then Dr. Lee Coombs, uh, one of our uh, fellow club members, will be providing a live tour telling about different features on the moon, and then also sharing some of his astrophotos of the moon as well. So we're really looking forward to that. Awesome. Okay, great. Yeah. And Brian will actually be the one that's going through the comments as well. So if you have a specific question or any, and honestly, everybody's going to be answering your questions. So feel free to ask those questions at any time. All right, should we get start? Brian, did I forget anything? Did I, if I got everything started? No, I think everything started. I see you live on the Facebook feed, so I think we're good. Yay! Okay, we're here. We're on Facebook. Uh oh, I think we're just. Oh, on I'm sorry. Uh, you. <laughs> Yes, it, that's in my imagination. <laughs> we, should, we should be on YouTube. <laughs> we are on YouTube. Right. Let's try this again. All right, so welcome everyone, Aurora and Brian, and now we are going to bring on Kent from Central Coast Astronomy. I have to pre-frame this first. So Kent is incredibly amazing at being able to um, understand what's it, what we're talking. Uh, how do I say this? He's just a super rock star when it comes to astronomy. So when I started 15, 16 years ago, I knew nothing about any stars. I didn't even know where the Big Dipper was. And I would get my little tiny telescope and I'd park it next to Kent and his big one you're going to see in a second. And just listening to him got me more acquainted with the night sky. And I would just do, you know, one constellation at a time or one object at a time. And, and I couldn't find a lot of things. So often I would say, Kent, where's this Kent? And he was so patient. And so I would just, I want to be able to share this resource with you as well. He is just an incredible resource. So we're going to bring him on. He is going to be audio only. So you, I will be sharing my screen with a free program called Stellarium. You can download it for free tonight at, at Stellarium.org. Brian will probably put that in the comments. Um, um, or somebody put it in the comments. And so you you will be hearing his audio and then I will be sharing the screen to show you what it is he's talking about. So it's gonna be just as if you were parked right next to his telescope tonight and he was pointing things out for you as well. All right, Kent, are you there? Hello, Kent. Hello, Aurora, Hi. I'm there. <laughs> awesome, how are you tonight? Okay, unfortunately, I wish I could have heard Alex's uh uh presentation on m56 but all i could hear was you know you would say something once in a while oh, i could no. see the image but again no more oh, could not okay. hear what else and it looked like it was really interesting yes i'll tell you what i'm sorry i thought we fixed that last time but i'll make sure to send you uh the recording so you you know exactly you'll be able to hear it oh, okay great. yeah i'm sorry yeah, about that i thought we fixed no, it no but... that's okay we we tried to fix we it we did <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so for tonight, um, just to introduce you, uh, people that have never met you before, I, I have a picture of you and your telescope here. Your first telescope wasn't a big one, was it? It was orange? Well, not no, your very actually, first. I but... think it was bought at Penny's. It was like a Pencraft 60 millimeter <laughs> refractor. It you know, it was an alt azimuth uh, mount, but it was a very nice alt azimuth mount. But this is the real and workhorse, right? The orange one. This that you is have? the one I put a lot of time in. Yes. Yeah, this is the old C8. I actually picked it up from a Cal Poly student uh, on Easy Ad. He was selling it, and uh, you know, I looked through it at a insulator on a telephone pole way down the street, and it was completely sharp. So I knew I had to get that telescope. Nice. And I've used that steadily for about 13 years until I bought the 20-inch uh, scope. 
And you actually have a book. I didn't know this until what, like a month ago that you actually, you have two books, don't you? Yeah, this is actually the 2017 uh, book. Uh, that's actually the Web Society mm -hmm. edition. Uh, <laughs> initially, I had like 112 of them printed up by Poor Richards Press and sold them myself. And then the Web Society was kind enough to pick it up and they're reprinting it and selling it. Oh, that's and wonderful. And so that's really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. And then cool. earlier in like uh, 1997, I had a green book I cranked out, I think about 200 copies total, <laughs> uh, which uh, I had called Planetary Pages. It had 303 planetary nebula visible in the old C8, that orange mm -hmm. uh, stubby telescope yeah. there. Now, and tell in fact, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was thinking that picture in the corner there is from Western Australia. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I uh, air freight, actually, I didn't, I brought it on his luggage. That's right. I brought the telescope on his luggage. And uh, the guys there are some of my friends. But uh, yeah. yeah, that was my first trip to Western Australia. I spent like three months there. You can see how flat it is. Yes. And the, the town is called Year Coin. And so kind of an interesting name for a town. Yeah. Now you took but, um, uh, this telescope, right? This mirror you took to Australia just to do observing, right? Oh, yeah. That was the uh, later on. I think my first trip was in 1999. And then 2003, uh, four and five, I went on separate trips with the 20 inch. Uh, you can see me standing there. That's actually the the prototype portable uh, 20 inch. You can see uh, the mirror is in a cabbage case, a really, uh, really well built case uh, for protecting equipment. Mm -hmm. And everything worked out right. I mean, that mirror went back and forth three times, no problem. Uh, was able to ship the telescope to Western Australia. And then when I got done in 2015, packed everything up and they shipped it back to LAX. Amazing, for me isn't to it? Pick up. <laughs> oh yeah, it worked. I mean, it's definitely well worth getting yes. an agent in both countries to it'll do all the, <laughs> you know, stuff that paperwork, I guess is it. Yeah. Grease in the wheel. It and, is. Uh, yeah. Well, you all went cool. It, that's awesome. And we get to benefit for all that time that you actually spent observing. So, <laughs> I'm excited about tonight's show. Now, when we start, do you want to start talking about the moon first? Um, yeah, we can talk about the moon. I know we're going to spend a lot it's, of time talking about the moon, but just that, you know. Yeah, the moon days. is, I think, what is it, like two days past uh, uh, new moon? It is. Yeah, we're a couple days past new moon. <laughs> so if you, when it gets dark, if you have a good western horizon, you should be able to see a little crescent out there. And if you wanted to observe... No problem. When it's that thin a crescent, you won't have problems with it interfering with your viewing. It's only when it starts getting, you know, about between, uh, about up to, let's say, not a half, but let's say kind of half of that, yeah. maybe a quarter, uh, it would start interfering with your viewing. But if it's just like a, a thin crescent or a nice crescent out there, you can observe and, you know, you won't have any problems. If you really get into it, the thing yeah. will set after a while yeah. and get out of your field. And so that's it's, that's the moon right now. And that that's perfect because on Tuesday, it, Brian, it's on Tuesday, right, that we're going to be doing the... Um... That's right. Live moon tour, 8 p.m. this Tuesday Pacific time. Okay, perfect. Great. And we'll, we'll make another announcement at the end. Okay. Are you ready to get started, Kent? Are you set? Yeah. All right. Um, what Let's we see, we've got a couple couple things for the uh, solar system, right? Uh, oh, yes. You Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we've got one is the summer solstice. Yes. Begins at 8.32 p.m. on June 20th. Mm -hmm. And so the next day, the 21st, will be the first full day of summer. Yes. But the day before the 20th will be actually when the summer solstice begins at 8.32, mm -hmm. and for people that have a good western horizon, uh, Mars will be in the beehive, or the Precep, or Messier 
44, which is in Cancer, and that'll happen on the 23rd. And so, you know, basically you'll have to get way over to the west, and, uh, you know, that should be kind of interesting because you've got that group of stars. There you go. And you can see Mars in there, and evidently it's pretty close on the 22nd. It's right in there on the 23rd and still kind of close on the 24th. So the 23rd would be the best time to see it inside that you know, that nice open cluster. That open cluster is also a naked eye open cluster, although you can see it's pretty close to the western horizon. So you got to have a good horizon. Uh, binoculars would be excellent to try, you know, for viewing that. Yeah, awesome. And so that's pretty much the interesting solar system stuff we have for this month. Perfect. Okay, great. Oh, you know, I had to reinstall Stellarium and I forgot to take the trees out. I don't know why they put trees on a, on a software program for <laughs> looking they, they at They make stars. it realistic. You can say know, that but, much for But them. they're in the way. <laughs> All right, I'll work on that. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to our first constellation. Now, I actually, I, this is a new constellation for me. So yeah, this is, we haven't covered this one in the mm -mm. past. No, we haven't. This is, this is Corona Borealis or the Northern Crown. Um, it's an ancient Greek constellation and it's got some interesting mythology, although it's kind of strung out about it. Uh, most people, uh, have heard of the Minotaur in the labyrinth. Mm -hmm. It was on Crete. The Minotaur was half man, half bull. And he was in this uh, big labyrinth that everyone would get lost and then he'd eat them. <laughs> and uh, the, the king of Crete and the king of uh, uh, Athens had a deal where every seven years they'd have, actually the Athenian king would send seven young men and seven young women as sacrifices uh, to this labyrinth uh, for the uh, minotaur, minotaur to eat. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, a young man by the name, I'm going to butcher all these names, and it's old <laughs> Greek names, but it's something like the Theseus, I guess. Uh, he wanted to kill the minotaur and take care of the problem. And uh, when he was on in Crete, the princess, the daughter of the king of Crete, fell in love with him, and her name was Eridon. Eridon, I'm, I'm butchering that. Yeah, that's, but that's okay. That's okay. Anyhow, <laughs> um, she gave him a sword and a uh, thread. I think it was a silver thread or something like that, a uh -huh. silk thread. That was it, so that he could find his way back out. And he did kill the Minotaur, and he did find his way out, and she eloped with him on a ship, but somewhere in the Mediterranean, he dumped her on an island, oh, no. and which was kind of a lousy thing to do, <laughs> and she was all upset about being dumped on the island until Bacchus came along with his crew. Bacchus was the god of wine and partying, and he fell in love with her and uh, you know, married her. She had a crown. Bacchus was actually a god, and god of partying and wine and all of that. <laughs> and but she was mortal, so she didn't live forever. So when she finally died, uh, Bacchus was really upset, and he threw her crown into the heavens. And that's and what we're so looking at here. That's what we've got for Corona Borealis or the Northern Crown. It's kind of a long, uh, long tail, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's how okay. it got there. <laughs> That's all right. Now, um, we also want to, this one's almost straight overhead tonight. Is that correct? It's pretty close. Uh, I, I know last night uh, I got home about 10 o'clock and everything was dark. Mm -hmm. And I looked up and I could see the keystone. And I couldn't tilt my neck up high enough. To see it. You know, as you get older, it's harder and harder to get your <laughs> view straight up. Yeah. Okay. But it, yeah, it's pretty much straight overhead. Let's say nine o'clock, ten o'clock. It's going to be a real neck breaker. Okay. Uh, so let, best let's to lay on your back and look straight. Look up. straight up. Okay. So let's um let's orient people because we want them to know where to look. So if they're lying down, looking nearly straight up, what's one of the things you'd be looking for? So here I'll put it kind of. This is what you would see. Well, you know, one thing you can you can kind of go for is. Uh, 
you know, last month we talked about, um, oh, uh, Boutiste, the constellation of Boutiste and the mm -hmm. brightest star, which I, is Octurus. That's mm -hmm. right. And so basically if you kind of go down through Boutiste, you get close to Corona Borealis. And the thing is about Corona Borealis, if you have binoculars, it'll stand out. You can see it naked eye, but uh, binoculars have a pretty good field, so you get a lot of it in binoculars. But it's it's not hard to find with that the crescent shape. It isn't complex, and so it's pretty easy to bring in. Okay. Okay. Great. So let's um let's show the night sky because as everyone knows, um <laughs> there's no dot to dot connecting lines in the night sky. It actually will look like this. So when they're um, in this bright thing over here, this is the moon. It's not shown in the right phase, but that's just know that's the moon and it won't be there tomorrow. It'll be somewhere else. So if you go outside and you lay down, you look straight up. Can you find the well here? Can you find uh, how about the, the why don't we start with the Big Dipper? So not you. Yeah, can, the Big I, Dipper. Almost everybody, everybody can find can see that. that. Yeah. So not you. I know you can find it. But right now, go ahead and point with your fingers here. Let me um, let me shake it up a little bit. There we go. Can you find the Big Dipper for me and put your hand on it? Put your finger on it. OK. So did you get this area over here? All right, so here's the Big Dipper. Do you see the stars in the handle? So if you can arc to Arcturus, you see how they make an arc and they go right through here? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of slide down and do you see the stars that make this U shape? And that's it, this is the constellation that he was talking about. So let's do it again. Here, um, I'll put my face on. All right, so here, we're gonna do it again. You ready? All right, now you find the Big Dipper. Ready, here we go. Can you find it? Okay, so find the, oh wait, I think I screwed this up. There we go. <laughs> so find the Big Dipper. Okay, you got it? Okay, so here it is. Get the handle and arc to Arcturus. Which one is Arcturus? That's right, you're gonna arc right to it. And then you're gonna slide on down and you'll see this, You should, did I get it right, Kent? Right in Yeah, here. you got it right. That's Corona Borealis. Perfect. And before you go on, I want to tell you, if you downloaded this a little earlier in the week, there is a typo on it. <laughs> so the um, the second thing we're going to talk about, which is Sigma, um, is in the wrong position on the handout. So um, I want you to circle the right position. So just know that if you got the first <laughs> edition, it's not right. So we're going to show you where that is right now. Okay, do you want to talk about the first one, though? Okay, you want to go for uh, new? Yes, let's do new first. We'll go for new uh, Corona Borealis. That's a Greek letter. Uh, it's actually new one and two. Yes. Uh, Corona Borealis. And the uh, kind of interesting thing is that it's a wide double star. You've got a visual magnitude 5.4 star and a visual magnitude 5.6 separated by 361 arc seconds, or approximately six arc minutes. Uh, both stars are yellow-orange in color, and it's a really nice binocular double. It's on the eastern side of Corona Borealis, near the border with Hercules. And you, in fact, you can see how the two stars, and I bet you if you had really good eyes, you might actually be able to split it but you can see they're they're quite close. Uh, separation uh, between those two. Did I put that in there? The separation? <laughs> I didn't even put this. Oh, yeah, I've got the, you yeah, the separation is about six minutes. That's right. Yeah, yeah, you got it. So that, that's pretty big uh, separation. So mm -hmm. that's a nice one to look at with binoculars. Yes. And that, that uh, that's actually a good starting point then okay. to go to the other uh, star that we've got. It's a binary called Sigma Corona Borealis. Okay, now talk and, me in how to find Sigma. How do okay, I do that? Okay, go back to new, okay. one and two, the got yellow it. ones. Mm -hmm. Go straight up from them just a little bit. That, right there. That's it, I okay. believe. And, yeah. yep, sure enough, that is a... Um, Magnitude, visual magnitude 5.6 star mm -hmm. and a visual magnitude 6.5 star separated by 7.26 arc seconds. So wow. they're fairly close together. Mm -hmm. They have an orbital period of like 726 years. Uh, the pair is about 74 light years from us. Uh, William Herschel discovered this double on August 7th 
1780. Uh, it's a binary uh, about one half, one and a half degrees west of new one and two. Uh, both stars appear yellow white and can be resolved in a good small telescope. The fainter component is about the same brightness as our sun. So if you were curious about what our sun would look like at 74 light years distance, then going to Sigma and looking at the fainter component will give you an idea how faint our sun would be at that distance. Oh, that's interesting. Nice. And I should mention here, because you notice that these two are not on this constellation that's drawn here, but yet they're still in the boundary, right? So that's still... right. And you've got the boundary showing up there, which is good. Yeah. So when we say it's in the constellation, um, it, it's actually the the it's not the the dot to dot things that you see yeah, here. Yeah, it's not it's... inside of the crown or right. on the crown. Right. It's actually kind of beyond it. And uh, some maps, you know, extend the crown. Some overlay a a rough crown on the thing, you know, an image. Uh -huh. uh, you know, but uh, you can blame the guys. I think it's 1930. They set up the boundaries for mm -hmm. everything, and because there was some real confusion on where it would go. Yeah, yeah, and that makes so, sense. So, you know, 19. I think it was either 19. Yeah, I think it was 1930. The International mm -hmm. Astronomical Unit set up all the boundaries and also set up the constellations because there's also weird little constellations. So yes, they, they came up with 88 constellations mm -hmm. and uh, set up the boundaries. And so uh, since it was the IAU, uh, you know, it's kind of like they're the authorities. So there's no more complaining at that <laughs> point. Right. So the boundaries is just a region of space. And so if, for example, if I said something was in Hercules and we were looking at an object, but it was clear over here, it's still in this region. This, um, this would be like a, a land region, you could imagine. It's still in the United States. It's just not in, you know, Texas. It's over here. Yeah, it might be Hawaii or might... Guam or exactly. Puerto Rico. Exactly. It's, it's or another something. area. Right. It's another part, but it's still within the boundaries that they've drawn for that constellation, just, just so there's no confusion on that. Okay, great. So um, before we move on to our next constellation, let's just do a quick recap. Can you guys find the Big Dipper for me? Here, let me take the boundaries off. Can you find me the Big Dipper? Go ahead, do it right now. Okay, good, did you find the handle? You know what I'm gonna ask you now. Arc to Arcturus, so where's Arcturus? Okay, now can you find uh, Corona Borealis? Okay, where we slide down, booties, and then we find this U shape. Okay, so let's zoom in a little bit. You tell me when you see Nu and you see Sigma. Can you tell me? I know Kent, you can see it. <laughs> Okay, so here's here's that upside down, or the, I guess it's facing to the left, okay? All right, and if we look here, we haven't talked about Hercules, but we're gonna talk about him really soon, okay? So we're going between this pattern of stars and something called a keystone, which it looks like a squashed uh, rectangle, okay? We're gonna go between these two. Do you see two orange double stars? So you would be exploring this area with your binoculars. So point to it when you see it. We're gonna zoom in. We're gonna zoom in. Yeah, do you see it now? <laughs> there it is. Okay, so this is the first object we talked about. This is new. And then we just slid up here and we found Sigma. So you can be able to look at both of those. Okay, great. All right, Kent, what's next on our on our flight plan here? Okay, we're going to uh, look at Hercules. Okay. Some interesting parts of Hercules. The first object will be the keystone, which is an asterism in Hercules. And in fact, that's what I saw above the roof of my house when I was looking in my front yard last night yeah was the uh and uh should we explain what a keystone is oh yes let's do that please because a, a keystone is the center stone in a in a actually a stone arch the romans used it a lot and you know a stone arch won't work unless you have a keystone and it's always narrower at the bottom and wider at the top kind of a wedge that sits in there and allows you to distribute the pressure all the way around. And, you know, if you didn't have a keystone, it all collapse on itself. And so that's a keystone. Perfect. And uh, so basically you can see how this, this uh, shape is kind of like a wedge shape. 
Mm-hmm. It's got a wider top and a narrower bottom and then two long sides. So they've always called this the keystone. It's formed by uh, four stars. There's uh, Ada, which is that one. Then the next one, uh, let's see, that one's Pi. Okay. And then that's Epsilon, and that's Zeta. Wow. <laughs> Had to go kind of backwards, but oh, it sorry. works. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay, great. And that's, you know, the keystone. The uh, the bottom of the keystone, uh, which is made up of zeta and epsilon, is to the south, where the top of the keystone, uh, made up of eta and pi, oh, that's the, actually the side. Yeah, <laughs> there's I know. There's pi, <laughs> there's eta, that's, that's on the northern side. Okay. So it's kind of aligned north south okay. on the uh for the uh the keystone there wonderful and so it's an uh, keystone is an asterism right so we can easily find it yeah it's it's you know a shape in a constellation it can be part of the constellation it can be you know a weird thing inside of the constellation okay you know it can be also you can use several pieces of constellations that's true huh to, you know right. like the uh the summer triangle is made out of three constellations. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And so asterisms are, are pretty flexible mm-hmm. uh, overall. And it's, you know, the ones that people remember stick and the keystones, one of them has stuck around. There's a lot of them people create and they just don't last. <laughs> you know, everyone forgets about them over time. But the keystone's been there for a long time. Yes. And so there's... It, it, yeah, go oh, ahead. Pardon? No, go ahead. <laughs> you know that well. That pretty well covers the keystone, then. Yes. But but there's a real interesting object uh, between Ada and uh, Zeta, I believe. Yeah. Right between and... these two. So if you look and you imagine Hercules, it's going to be right above his hip on the left side. In fact, you can see it. Yeah, if you blow that thing up. I can blow it up. Absolutely. Do you see it you now? You can see it's no longer stellar. It's kind of fuzzy and fat. Yeah, what is that? And that's, that is the uh, famous globular cluster. They call it the Great Hercules Cluster, but also it's called Messier 13. Mm-hmm. And uh, Brian has a picture of it right behind him yeah, there. Yeah, Brian, are you there? Let's see. Let's check in with you. you I'm here. You took that picture, didn't you? I did. Yes, you yes. did. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's a real nice close-up of it. You can see how many stars are just packed in there. Yes, let me pull up that slide again. There you go. There's Brian's picture. Yeah, I really enjoy M13 because the more power you can throw at it, the more stars you see. It's great from binoculars all the way to whatever size telescope you might want to use to look at it, I think. Oh, yeah. I remember with my C8, I'd set it up so I'd figure out which way it was drifting, and I'd pull the field of view just out and then just have someone look through the eyepiece, and it would slowly drift in, and all of a sudden you have a few stars, then you have more stars, then you have a gazillion (laughs) stars. And, you know, people really loved seeing that effect. That's so cool. So they'd just be looking and it wouldn't look like much. And then all of a sudden this globular cluster would come yeah, across. Yeah, it just kind of moves in because you're not doing any tracking. You're right. As long as you've got the path down, it'll go right through the field of view of your eyepiece. That's awesome. And so that was always fun to show my friends. Mm-hmm. And this, this shot by Brian, you can also see those two stars on either side that are, uh, I think they're seventh magnitude stars. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're fairly bright. And let's see, what do I have to say about M13? It's a globular cluster. Uh, It's the great Hercules cluster also. It's got a visual magnitude of 5.7 and probably contains around a million stars. It's about 26,000 light years distance and about 160 light years across. Uh, M13 was discovered by Edmund Haley in 1714. So that's way before Messier and Herschel and those guys. Mm -hmm. And it's visible to the naked eye under good conditions. Uh, My eyes have never been good enough to see it (laughs) naked eye, but you know, if you if you were a young person with good eyesight yeah. or slightly far sighted, mm-hmm. uh, I could see how you'd see like 
uh, a fat star is probably what it would look like yeah. or a fat fuzzy object. And so, you know, it can be pulled in that way. It's located about uh, uh, 2.5 degrees south of Ada and a bit west. But you can see it's pretty much on a line between Ada and Zeta there. And so it's pretty easy to find. Uh, it shows up in binoculars. 750 binoculars will show a, a fuzzy patch uh, with those two bright stars on either side or the 17th or 7th magnitude stars. Uh, in my 8-inch, it's just fantastic. Beautiful cluster of stars. Nice. And you said if it wasn't for this object, like if that object wasn't there, everybody would be looking at this other object, right? Yeah. Yeah, the next one in line. I mean, if M13 disappeared, everyone would be bragging about M92, <laughs> which is our next globular cluster. Okay. Uh, in fact, you've got it there, but you can see how it's kind of like uh, it's it's north of the top of the wedge, so you can actually, you know, or the keystone. You can, you know, look at the keystone. It's north of it. Uh, it also forms almost like an equilateral triangle mm -hmm. with the pi and the eta stars, and then, uh, you know, M92. I usually start at like pi, and then there's some little stars that kind of bridge in the arc. There's some faint ones that arc over there, mm -hmm. and then kind of take a wild jump into the uh, blue yonder there. <laughs> and, you know, basically it'll show up in binoculars. So okay. uh, you'll see something that'll go like, eh, it doesn't look like a star. It looks slightly fat. <laughs> and that, that's when you swing your scope on it to, you know, make sure what you're looking at. Yes. Uh, they say the specs on its visual magnitude 6.5, so it's a little bit beyond normal eyesight. It's 27,000 light years distant, so slightly further than the Hercules cluster. Contains about 700,000 stars. It's about 110 light years across. And jo Jonah Bode discovered it on December 27, 1777. Bode's also the guy that found that really pretty galaxy, mm -hmm. which we call M81, up in uh, Ursa Major, or yes. the Big Bear. Uh -huh. And there's also M82 next to it. So Bode made a few good discoveries there. And, uh, you know, in 750 binoculars, you'll see it as like a bloated or fuzzy patch, mm -hmm. a bloated mm -hmm. star. And uh, so that's pretty much uh, the specs on it. Great. Well, let's how um, you find it. Yeah, let's let's talk about how we find it. Let's go back and review a little bit. So um, here, let me drive for a sure. second. Um, OK, so let me take off everything. So it looks like what you'd be looking at tonight. So you go outside, you basically walk outside and you lay down and you look up and you tell me where is the Big Dipper? Can you find it? Okay, great. Now, Arc to Arcturus. So here's the Big Dipper. Arc to Arcturus. Okay, good. Now, can you find Coriona, Corona Borealis? Okay, so here's the Big Dipper. Here, if I actually put Arcturus on the screen, you could find yeah, it. There's there Arcturus we go. Now. <laughs> there we go. So we're arcing to Arcturus, sliding down. Do you see the the U shape? Yep. Okay, great. Do you now? If I zoom in, can you tell me where the Keystone is? We're sliding down. Here's that U-shape. Where's the keystone of Hercules? Yeah, so this constellation kind of points to it. Do you see it here? You can see the four stars here. This is the keystone of Hercules. And between the keystone and between that U-shape of Corona Borealis, you're going to find a double star, a double orange star. Can you point to it? I can actually see it right now, but it might be a little small on your screen. So let me blow it up. Okay, oh, here's the keystone. Here's that upside down U, the crown. Yeah, it's right there, isn't it? Good. Okay, so this one was new. The one that was right above it was Sigma. Okay, we're going to look for two more things. So let's slide on over to Hercules. Now, show me M13. Can you find M13? Okay, so let's outline the keystone first. Okay, and notice that these two stars are a little closer together than these two. Okay, so this is his, this is his waistline, and these are his shoulders. So go to his waist and find his left hip and it's right in this area. So tell me when you find it. Tell me when you see it. Do you see it? Do you see it now? Yes, 
right in there, M13. Okay, great, we've got one more to go. So let's back out a little bit, back out. Okay, we see the keystone again. Do, do, do. Now, let's form that equilateral triangle. So one, two, where's the third part of that equilateral triangle? What do you think? Here, if I zoom in a little bit, because let's pretend we've got binoculars. Do you see anything yet? Something that doesn't quite look like a star anymore? Anything yet? Here, I'll highlight it for you. Ready? Did you get it? Do you see it here? One, two, three. Yeah, if you chose this star, not a problem. Just scoot on over a little bit. This is the star that Kent says he actually starts with, and then he scoots over. Or no, maybe you, you start here, don't you? And then you, yeah, I start you know, with those. and Yeah, you start with this one and you slide over. And then you know, if you, the other thing that really helps is having a good chart like a Sky yeah. Atlas 2000 or whatever you can get your hands on at a reasonable price. <laughs> uh, yes. So many of the charts have gotten so totally ridiculous. Oh, yes, it, I know. And, I, you know, you may not know this, but Kent actually corrects some of those charts. Do you still do that? I know you were correcting computer programs at one point. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I find errors on the charts, but it's too late. They they really don't do like a steady publication with additions and things like that. And so you can find glitches yeah. on any chart. Yeah. And uh, one really sad thing was on the Sky Atlas 2000, the second edition removed this bright planetary nebula. I remember that's down during in the Fornax. Yeah. You know, it, it's I think it's NGC 1360 the comet uh, nebula. Mm -hmm. But it's it's on the old the first edition it's on there and it, it's easily seen in an 8 inch scope. And yet on the second edition they just booted it off. For oh some no, reason. that's terrible. And so, you know, things happen. They do. No, no atlas is perfect. Uh, no. If you really get into it, you can go online and they've scanned in a lot of the Mount Palomar uh, slash National Geographic survey mm -hmm. uh, uh, photographs that they took with that big Schmidt camera. Yeah. And uh, they put a lot of that stuff online. So you can actually print out a field and what you want to go for. Yes. And uh, take that out. But that's really kind of advanced. No, the easiest yeah. thing is, is try and find some sort of sky atlas that's not crazy in price, you know. You know, within 20 bucks, 25 bucks, you know, some of these they want like 110 or something, which is, is crazy. No, no. And that, we actually tell people at the beginning, right, to, to pick up this thing. Sorry, it fell on the floor. Um, for free. Yeah, so those are just, those are, are a great. great beginning, especially yeah. with binoculars and when you get into the telescopic stuff. Yeah. Then you know there's there's actually something called the Norton uh, Sky Atlas, I believe, uh, the Norton Atlas, mm -hmm. and they've been published for a long, long time. It's not as good as the Sky Atlas 2000, but it's adequate. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, if you want to spend, I think you can probably get one on Amazon or eBay for like five bucks. Yes. And oh. That would be a good working thing. We forgot. There's one more object in Hercules. I'm yeah, just there thinking, is. I was There's thinking about. There's actually two more objects <laughs> in Hercules. <laughs> Whoops. No, mm -hmm. two. I, we're, we already yeah, did we, M90. Remember, remember Raz Al Getty? Oh. We got Raz Al Getty. How about I let you but, drive? Okay. Why don't you tell me what else, what else is in but, Hercules? <laughs> Let's, let's start with the Turtle Nebula. Let's go to the Turtle. Or NGC 6210, because that's close to the, you know, you can use the wedge to get there. And it's a, it's a small planetary nebula. They call it the Turtle Nebula, I think, due to the images that came back on the Hubble telescope. Oh. And you've got it there. Um, it's visual magnitude 8.8, .8, which is fairly bright for a planetary. Uh, it's got a size of 20 arc seconds by 13 arc seconds. It was discovered by George Wilhelm van Struve. He was a double star observer. And I think he originally thought that was a double star until he looked at it under higher magnification and discovered it was a small nebula. And he did this, let's see, he made the discovery in 1825. So it was, you know, out there a ways. Yeah. Uh, this this planetary nebula can be blinked 
through an 8 by 50 finder scope using an old three filter. Okay. You essentially put a dark cloth over your head, take the filter, and move it between the eyepiece and your eye. And when you put it in there, it'll pop in and you move the filter away and it disappears. That's why they call it blinking. Oh, got when it. You've got the filter in the eyepiece, you see it. When you move it away, it's gone. <laughs> and uh, it works. I mean, I've done that with... Uh, on my C8. Now this is this is one you need a telescope for, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's not a you know naked eye object or no. You can use a binocular to get into the area. Yeah. To find out roughly where it is. Uh huh. But when you really want to see it, you you know a six inch or yeah. an eight inch. So how and do the you? The thing is, I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. Pardon? I was going to ask how you oh. star hop it to it, but go ahead. Finish what you were saying. There's not a real easy way to No, there isn't. I mean, here's one way. Uh, you can see those two stars that are, you've got the wedge there, and if you continue the wedge towards the turtle nebula, see how there's a couple of bright stars kind of out there, outliers? Yeah, those two. Mm -hmm. Those point roughly in the direction of where you want to hunt. Okay. And, you know, if you have a nice thick sky atlas, you can use those little stars around there to get in even closer. You know, as you blow up the field, more stars pop in up to a certain limit. And, uh, you know, basically uh, that's what I would do is I'd okay. start at that one and then just kind of work my way uh, towards there using, initially I would use my binoculars and my atlas, open mm -hmm. up the atlas, uh, use binoculars to see roughly where I want to go. Then I would, you know, grab the scope and put the finder scope on that telescope roughly in the area then do kind of a spiral search pattern. Right. Uh, the one thing is you always, when you search for something, use your lowest power. That'll give you the widest field so that you won't like skirt on by it and lose it. Yes. No, it, it's, it's, it's right. Yeah, it's oh, this one right here, right? Yeah. See how it looks green? Mm-hmm. It physically, when you look through the eyepiece of an eight inch, let's say with, oh, you're at 64 power or so you will actually see it looks like a little green star initially. And then you like up the magnification, you can see more, it becomes more disc-like. Yeah. And so it's kind of, there's a handful of them that are green planetaries that, you know, really kind of shine. Yes. Uh, there's another one called the cat's eye, which is really popular for yeah. the star parties. It is. That's uh, a you know, popular during one. During the summer, I usually, you know, have a request to, put the cat's eye in <laughs> and it's another one at low power it looks like a little green star mm -hmm. then you blow it up and you get all sorts of neat stuff pops yeah. out so that's the turtle nebula perfect and, and now then we tell got me about, one more yeah tell me about the binary oh yeah okay. this is raz al okay. which it sounds like the evil character in a batman comic or something <laughs> but it's actually alpha hercules or hercules it's a variable star plus it's a binary. And Raz al Gedi is derived from the Arabic, uh, meaning the head of the kneeler. And Hercules was depicted in some of the old charts as kneeling. So I think they actually called him the kneeler. It may be even more ancient than the, the myth of Hercules. Oh, interesting. But it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, uh, double star actually binary star because the brighter component is a red giant with a variable brightness. It goes between a magnitude 2.7 mm -hmm. and a magnitude 4.0. And so it can vary. Uh, and William Herschel discovered this variability in 1795. Uh, the companion has a visual magnitude of 5.6. Um, and the separation between the two is 4.6 arc seconds. So they're fairly close. Yeah. Uh, an orbit, they have an orbital period of about 3,600 years. Uh, Neville Maskelyne discovered the double in 1777. Uh, this binary is about 400 light years distance from us. And Raz al Gedi also, it's got a wonderful color contrast with the brighter orange star and a mm -hmm. fainter blue star. Nice. 
and there's a really neat way of finding it. If, if you yes. know where the head of Ophiuchus is, you can just go straight over there and see this one kind of semi-bright star all by itself. And that's Raz Al Getty. You can see it's a long ways from the wedge. Yeah. It's one of those ones that's right near the border. It is right near the border. I had the borders on a minute ago. So if you um, can see the keystone, go ahead and point it out to me. It should be on the left side of the screen, kind of near the top. Do you see it? Okay, you see that? Okay, great. So here's the keystone of Hercules. Really quick, point to M13. Can you see, find it? Where's M13? Uh-oh, where is it? <laughs> right, that's right. It's right in here. M92, where are you going to be looking? That's right, one, two, and where's our third point? Oh, it's somewhere in here, and it's okay if you don't have the exact position. Totally fine. You're just going to explore with your binoculars until you see something fuzzy like this guy right there. Okay, great. And then the turtle is over here. You remember how Kent told us to find the turtle? You find the keystone, and then you can kind of make a, an extension line here, and then you see these two bright stars and kind of they intersect sort of you kind of start to spiral out you start here with your binoculars you spiral around until you can find it but it's mostly a um a telescope object all right and the last one was uh ras al getty so if you see the keystone here and we covered Ophiuchus another time so let me just let me show you kind of where it is and what right. it looks like you've got the, looks the like head that. of Ophiuchus yeah. there Ophiuchus is a guy who is wrapped in a snake and serpents we're going to talk about in just a second it's the only constellation that Kent's going to talk about that's broken in two um, and so you can see his head here is a really bright star so if I take all that off can you kind of visualize it now? So we have the keystone. In fact, I see one way of getting to that head star is oh, yeah. do, do a diagonal through the uh, keystone. Oh, yes. And then you just go right, there's a star, and then boom, you hit the bright one in the head. Then you just go over, right there. and there's Raz Al Getty. Perfect. So you can just connect the diagonal lines of the keystone of Hercules, and then take a little hop here and hop to the head star of Ophiuchus, and then you'll find Raz Al Getty. Awesome. Perfect. All right. We have um, serpents is really fast. There's only one or two things here, right? Well, actually, we've got a couple more. We've got two more constellations to hit. Yes. Uh, we've got uh, what they call Serpens Caput, which mm -hmm. is the head of the serpents. It's mm -hmm. an ancient Greek constellation. It's the only constellation split into two parts. The part we're looking at is on the western side of Ophiuchus. It's mm -hmm. Serpent's Caput, where the eastern one is the tail of the serpent, which is Serpent's Caudia. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to talk about Serpent's Caput. It's, you know, again, an ancient Greek constellation. Um, but there's some, a couple of really interesting, there's like a twofer. Uh, there's a really nice globular cluster, M5, which is a fantastic object. And I can actually see it there on the screen. Is that it right there? There you go. That's it. That's M5. Yay. Sometimes the program won't let you me see it. You see how it's it. fuzzy and, and see the star right below it? Yes. That's five serpents. When you look in your binoculars, you will notice there'll be like this star. And then just right next to it, there'll be this fuzzy area. <laughs> and it's, it's real easy to find as long as you look in the right part of the sky <laughs> so what is the right part of the sky let me take these off so when people are looking well here let me get rid of the moon hang on a second um let me change the date to a few days from now there we go okay uh because normally the moon won't be there except for tonight all right so if we're in the night sky like this and i see the big dipper i see arcturus mm, where am i going now Let's yeah, this is a ways away. I mean, you, you want to go over to Ophiuchus, actually. Okay. And so Ophiuchus is above. You actually, you've got the moon in Scorpius. I know, right I know. I should, I should have changed but the I mean, year <laughs> or something. You know, <laughs> Ophiuchus kind of stands on the back of the scorpion. So like... uh, I can see the, the top head of Ophiuchus. And then you can see the, the snake kind of... Uh, right there mm -hmm. and it's actually a little bit west of the snake which would be up in this orientation mm -hmm. and so i don't know if you can trigger m5 there to do the little bracket yes, thing i can let me do but that. you can kind of see its orientation with respect to the 
the uh, the snake there. Okay. So the easiest thing to do is find the snake, which is along the side of Ophiuchus, mm -hmm. and go westward with your binoculars and look for that star with a little fuzzy companion next to it. And that's M5. And actually, M5 is a fantastic object. Uh, I'll go through the specs of yeah, it. Please, it's go a ahead. globular cluster. Uh, it's got a visual magnitude of 5.7. So theoretically, someone with good vision should be able to see it under good conditions. It's about 26,600 light years distance. It's about 150 light years across and probably contains around 1.3 million stars. It was discovered by... Gottfried Kitsch on May 5th, 1702. So he found it fairly early in the search for deep sky objects. Um, you know, in 750 binoculars, you see it as a fuzzy patch, about 20 uh, arc minutes north northwest of uh, this double star five serpents. And it's a fantastic object in my 20 inch because it's got a condensed core. Uh, you can actually, if the, the scene is really good, you'll see little pinpoint stars right in the core all packed next to each other, and they'll ripple in brightness as, you know, the air currents go by. Cool. And so it's really something fantastic to see. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, just, just a slight variability in scene looks like a ripple across the face yes. of M5. Another cool thing is when I was down in Australia – with my old C8, my old eight inch, mm -hmm. that, that orange scope. Yeah. I put my, put the scope on 47 Tucana, which is, I consider it the best globular cluster in the sky. Yes. It's right next to the small Magellanic cloud. And it happened to be the time of year where I could flop my scope over and look at M5 and do a comparison. And in their shape, they look very similar. They've got both condensed cores, mm -hmm. but it's like, if you took M5 and made it four times larger, oh, you wow. know, you know, I mean, made it made it about four times larger. That would be 47 Tucana. Oh, got uh, but it. still, M5 by itself, you know, it's neat being able to do a comparison. Yeah, if your it telescopes is. go back and forth, there yes. you only have to go to the southern hemisphere to do that. <laughs> but oh, that's uh, all right. It, you know, M5 is a fantastic globular cluster, and yes. it's the bigger a scope you can put on it, the better it looks. Mm -hmm. awesome. And then next thing to hit is the little star next to it. This is kind of like what I call twofer. Mm -hmm. You get two things. You've got a globular cluster, but also you got have a double star. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's called Five Serpents. It's a double star, visual magnitude 5.1 star, and a visual magnitude 10.1 star. So the brighter star is roughly about 100 times brighter than the fainter star. They're separated by 11.4 uh, arc seconds. The brighter star appears yellow, while the fainter star appears kind of whitish. And at low power in your scope, you should be able to get that double and M5 in the same field. Yeah. Perfect. And you know, depending on how steady the scene is, um, you know that's that's the important thing. The scene's really good. You'll you know you'll see the nice core, but also you'll see the dub, actual double star there. Wow, that's so, so cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's nice. kind of the the cool thing in uh, Serpent's Caput. I know it's such a fun name. Can we go on to our last one? I know we're getting near the top of the hour, but if you've got another ten minutes to spend sure, with let's, us. Let's, Let's do our last, this, con this is my favorite constellation. So let's go we, over there. We've got uh, Vega here. Yes. Or actually I should start with the constellation, which is Lyra, which is a lyre, a musical instrument. It's an ancient Greek constellation and it has a very bright star in it. Mm -hmm. And that bright star is Vega or Alpha Lyra. It's mm -hmm. the fifth brightest star in the sky with a visual magnitude of 0 0.03. So it's, almost a zero magnitude star it's fairly close it's 25.3 light years mm -hmm. and vega itself is a main sequence star 
about 1.5 solar masses and about 54 times brighter than mm-hmm. our sun. And uh, 12,000 years from now, it'll be our pole star. Oh, wow. But uh, I, I should explain what I meant by a main sequence star. Um, it means yeah. just, just a really quick explanation. I'm yeah. not going to get into <laughs> astrophysics, but it Wait. means it's, it's still burning hydrogen in the core. It's, you know, it was born burning hydrogen in the core, and it's still burning hydrogen in the core. Yes. So it's, it's you know, relatively young. So it's, you know, kind of a happy star, and it's, you know, it's easy to find. Uh, it is. It's it... also part of the summer triangle, but I don't think we'll get into that no, yet. No, no. And if you just walk outside and go east and a little bit north, like, uh, east northeast it looks like it's straight up and it's a really really bright star so you'll be able to find it and then you'll see this parallelogram right next to it do you see if you just drop down under that you'll see this parallelogram of stars and that that's the whole constellation right there so and we so, you want to talk about the double double yeah let's talk about the double double this is a famous uh, double star right it's here. epsilon lyra one and two and under normal circumstances, most people see a single fourth magnitude star. Mm-hmm. That's pretty much what I see, about 1.7 degrees east, northeast of Vega. If you have good eyes and they're in good conditions, you might be able to split uh, Epsilon into Epsilon 1 and 2. Uh, they're aligned roughly north and south. Epsilon 1 will be the northern component. Epsilon 2 will be the southern component. And 750 binoculars will split it definitely. I mean, it'll, you'll see both of them. They're about 208 uh, arc seconds apart. Under good conditions, um, when you look at, let's say, with a 3-inch telescope, and I've done it with a, a 90 millimeter, which I guess, yeah, it's just a little mm-hmm. over 3 inches. Uh, Epsilon 1 will split into a visual magnitude 5.0 yellow star and a visual magnitude 6.1 blue star with a separation of 2.3 arc seconds. And these two stars have an orbital period of about 1,725 years. Also, Epsilon 2 will split into a visual magnitude 5.3 yellow star and a visual magnitude 5.4 5.4 yellow star with a separation of 2.4 arc seconds. And uh, these, uh, these two stars have an orbital period of 724 years. So you can see they're almost the same brightness for yeah, Epsilon 2. They are. And that's how they come up with, you know, thus you get the double-double nickname. Right. Uh, so just to be clear, there's two stars, and each of those two stars is also two stars. So you've got... Right. Right, they each split into their own double. Their own so double. You end up, in yes. fact, I think as William Herschel first called it, the double double. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, if the scene's good, you should be able to split them up. Uh, if the scene isn't good, they'll just look elongated. <laughs> It'll so look like a. It really okay. ties down to how good that night is. Yes. That you're using to look at the double double. But it's definitely worth going after with a telescope or at least. Use the binoculars, and you can split it into Epsilon 1 and Epsilon 2. Nice. So okay, that covers great. the double-double. Now we're going for the really neat one. Now this is the one I really like. So Yeah, this, this is M57, a planetary mm-hmm. nebula. It's known as the Ring Nebula. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, it's really got a visual mm-hmm. magnitude of 8.8 and uh, actual size of 80 second, 86 arc seconds by 63 arc seconds. It's roughly about 2,300 light years away, and it's easily found between two naked eye stars, Beta Lyra and Gamma Lyra. Okay, wait, hang on. Okay, so the parallelogram here, let me take this off. So the parallel, you, you find this thing, and then you find the parallelogram of stars, and the double double is the elongated star right over there, here, yep. but it's not one of the four stars in the parallelogram. So then you slide over here, and you look between these two and just a little bit over and tell me when you see a Cheerio. You see like a donut or a Cheerio? Right there. So if I zoom out and put the constellation markers back on, you see where it is? 
Okay, great. It's an easy find between those two totally stars. Totally easy. <laughs> it's so easy to find. Yep. And so what is it that we're looking at here? This is a picture taken by Alex, the guy that we heard from initially. Right. It's, um, Oops. you know, planetary Sorry, Ryan. nebula. Hang on. <laughs> Sorry, wrong person. <laughs> I was looking for the, the picture that he took. Okay, there we go. And yeah, there's a nice image of it. You can see, it's hard to see, but you can see a central star on there. And that's the remnant. Uh, when you get stars, they think about a solar mass or one and a half solar masses. When they die, the remnant will get hot enough to make the outer layers that have been shed, uh, you know, over time to glow. Mm -hmm. And you get these glowing gases. And so uh, the ring actually in my telescope, uh, you get the 20 inch, it looks like more of an elliptical or a donut mm -hmm. uh, shape. And uh, if you've got nice conditions also, you'll notice that across the dark center, there's like a gauze there's like a faint glow inside of it. And I've seen that with my eight inch. Oh, wow. And so that's, yeah, that's a really nice shot there. Yeah. The central star is really, really hard to see on there. The problem is you've got this gauze or glowing thing. And so it's, it's really important to have really, really good seeing and a good size scope helps. Perfect. Okay, great. Yeah. And then... Uh, we Let's have one. See, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a little more information yeah, here. Yeah, please go uh, ahead. Yeah, um, for everyone out there, all the books say De Carre discovered it. It's a Frenchman. Uh -huh. um, you know, they, they, for so long we thought that this Frenchman uh, De Carre, De Carre. Oh, yes, yeah, De Carre. I'm butchering it. But anyhow, it turns out our good old friend Charles Mezier really is the discoverer of it. And there's an <laughs> article in Sky and Telescope, the June 2017 issue, page 32. They have a real strong argument for Mezier discovering it. The problem is, is how language was used back then and now. Oh. Uh, discovery kind of meant observed. And so it led to confusion that's gone on forever until recently. <laughs> and so it turns out it's, it's Charles Mezier discovered it first on January 31st, 1779. And my book that you showed is wrong. And my previous oh. book is wrong. <laughs> and all these other books out there are wrong. Oh, well. you, know, you have to find, have to find something printed after 2017. Well, so yeah. th this is right. The handout is right. The handout's the right. Handouts yeah, are, this is the, the most handout. updated information you can get, <laughs> and it's free. <laughs> All right, what One else do you want to? Another thing is yeah. that you can blink uh, the ring nebula mm -hmm. through your eight by fifty finder scope if you use uh, like an O3 or a UHC filter. Same thing. Move the filter between your eye and eyepiece, mm -hmm. and it'll pop in. If I just try and see it through my finder scope. Without a filter, there's I, I just can't do it. Yeah. But use the filter, it blinks, you know, just really well. Yeah, and you're not yeah, going to see so. something like this. It's not going to look like that. It's no, going to look it's like. it's not going to look like that. It's it looks look like, like a that. <laughs> it look like a gray donut, a yes. small gray donut. Even in an eight inch, it'll look like a small gray donut. Yes. In fact, I think I call it Homer's donut at our star <laughs> parties. All right, we you have. Know, when you look at it through the 20 inch. Now yeah. we've got one more. Got one which more. Alex went through in great detail. Yes, he did. And I wish I could have heard it. But no, you it's, will. It's a neat, you will. <laughs> it's a neat globular. Okay. And there's a kind of a cool way to find it. Okay, tell me. Um, okay, uh, you see, remember we we're looking at gamma and beta uh, with the ring between those two? Mm -hmm. And I believe beta is the lower star and gamma is the upper star. Okay. Hope I got that right. No, actually, gamma in this orientation. Oh, did I reverse it? Yeah, beta is okay. the upper and gamma is the lower. Gamma is the lower. Okay, so we start at, uh, at gamma. Mm -hmm. And you, if you take gamma straight down, you're going to hit Alberio, which is like the wonderful double star in the sky. It's actually beta Cygnus, the mm -hmm. swan. 
Yeah. And uh, it's a naked eye, wonderful gold and blue double star. Yeah. But it's actually M56 is halfway in between uh, uh, Gamma, I guess. Yeah, Gamma. I think I got and, it. And uh, Alberio. And you can see this little fuzzy patch there. Right in there. So best thing to do is take your binoculars and go halfway in between. Look for something fuzzy. <laughs> so again, and let um, me give the, yeah, go ahead. You give, let out me the, give the specs on this guy. Uh, mm -hmm. It's magnitude 8.4, so it's fairly dim for globular. It's 27,400 light years distant. It's about 55 light years across and contains about 320,000 light or thousand stars. Uh, it can be seen in 1050 binoculars discovered by Charles Mezier on March 19, 1779. An 8-inch telescope will resolve it into stars. And yeah, right here I had, you know, M56 is between Gamma, Lyra, and Alberio in Cygnus. Perfect. And let me get that back Did up. Did I get that right or was it beta? Hang on, hang on. Beta was the top one. I've got it right here. So um, so the first one is beta, and then we have gamma. Second one's gamma. Okay, And good. then um, here's alberio. And so... Yeah, there's alberio. Perfect. Yes. And so you go right between them and... Let's go right between them. And you tell me, uh, everyone, when you start to see a fuzzy. Do you see a fuzzy in this area? I know, Kent, you probably see it, but it's right I see it. there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, perfect. And just to recap real quick, um, uh, the last couple things we did. So you're going to go outside tonight. For the most part, we were looking up on our back, looking for the Big Dipper, looking for Arcing to Arcturus to, oh, here was my face, um, and finding Arcturus. And from there, we're sliding down to find the crown and so forth. And we did that a number of times. But this last set, we were actually going outside looking east and looking up to find Vega, which is here. So we're outside. We're looking east. And then a little bit kind of northeast, kind of between northeast and east. And you're just going to go up to see a really bright star. And you know you've got the right bright star because you see a parallelogram underneath. You won't see these red splotches. That's just the program. Um, <laughs> so you'll see this parallelogram here. And then remember there was a double-double, which was here. And the ring was halfway between these two. And then if you take these two and just extend the line down to, this one's really pretty too. And you can take a look at that one as well. This is Alberio. And we didn't have time to talk about that one tonight. But if you go halfway between, you'll find M5. And I'll zoom in and you'll see a fuzzy right about there. Sometimes the program doesn't let me click on it. Or M56. I'm sorry, M5. Right? Listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. M56. There it is. <laughs> and you'll see M56. So we did it! Woohoo! <laughs> hey, it wasn't bad. What what we run? It's about eight fourteen, so a little over an hour. A little That's bit not more. Bad. Yeah, we did a little bit more chit chatting this time. Absolutely. I actually had something I wanted to share with you all. If you have a few more minutes, um, I have some astrophotography images taken from our members that were um that are part of Central Coast Astronomy, and I wanted to share with those images with you. I just had a few of them. Do you want to see them? Okay, so real quick, we have um, Peter who has taken these images. Now, I, I know I put the numbers up there, uh, Kent, but what are these things real quick? Okay, the, the top one there says NGC 4565. Uh -huh. That's a beautiful edge-on spiral galaxy called the Needle Galaxy. Perfect. Yeah, I know we've covered that in detail before. Yeah, that's, that's a really nice object in Coma Bernices. Uh -huh. And then the one right below it that isn't as extended, but you can still see a dark lane across it. It's another galaxy called the Sombrero Galaxy, or M104. Mm -hmm. It's in Virgo. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then like this... an alien telescope, when you wait for it to get high in the in the south, it'll you be, should be able to see that dust lane running across there. Yeah. And the final one, M16, is the Eagle one. And that's the one where the Hubble telescope took those pictures that they called the pillars of creation. That's right. Those great big columns of dust. Mm -hmm. And in my 20-inch, mm -hmm. I could see the two smaller pillars 
I could not see the big pillar because there's a star there. It right. kind of washes it out. Yeah, and, and we had another member who's actually stargazing tonight. He wanted to join us, but he, he he took his telescope out to a real dark place. And Dave Majors wanted to give a shout out to him as well. He took uh, also another picture of the needle. Uh, NGC. Yeah, that's a nice nice picture of the needle nice there. Picture. You can see the core mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. the uh, the needle there. Yeah. And then straight down below, it's the lagoon, mm -hmm. which is in Sagittarius. And that's a threefer. You've got uh, an open cluster. You've got a dark nebula lane that runs through it. And then you've got a little bright nebula just on the other side. So yeah. that's also a naked eye object. In the summertime, you look towards Sagittarius, mm -hmm. and you can see the lagoon hanging out there. Nice. And so it's, it's a really nice object for the summertime. Mm -hmm. And then the final one is M42, which is the Orion Nebula. And that's more of a, of a winter thing. So uh, we're kind of, you know, on the short end of that. <laughs> we'll have to wait for a while before that comes up. Yeah, you'll be up if, pretty if late. <laughs> if you're real patient during the fall or let's say October and you stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> Orion will be coming up and you should be able to see that. Yes, and actually, speaking of staying up really late, Brian, this is your setup, isn't it? Uh-oh, maybe I lost it. That's all, I'm just watching for it to come up. Yes, that is, oh. that is my, <laughs> my, my deep sky image um, setup. Mm -hmm. And this is what you were sharing your live views were when, when it was dark, when we were doing Exactly, sky and yeah. I've now added a new mount as an option that has GPS so that I can set it up during the day and be ready to go right when it gets dark. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, cool. Yes, that would be awesome. And then we have one quick announcement. We uh, we are wrapping things up, but if you would like more, you actually are in luck because in a couple of days, we are gonna be having a free tour of the moon. And what's so really, what is super cool about this is the astronomer that's gonna be doing that is Dr. Lee Coombs. And he is, a, he's been doing astrophotography for maybe 40 years. And so he's had over a thousand of his images published. A lot of them were on film, if you can believe that. And so he has a lot of images that are in astro, uh, a lot of books on astronomy. And he sees a lot. And he actually did a whole series just on the moon a couple of months ago. It was so popular. We're going to do it again. And he so he his thing is i want to show you what most people miss and so that is going to be on tuesday on june 15th at 8 p.m and he's going to share with you the pictures he took as well as what you can see with binoculars and he's going to take you on a seven day tour of the moon all in one day and so he'll start you on the first day and then after that you'll know what to look at and you'll see a little more and a little more each night which is super cool but we're just going to do one night we'll do all seven days in one night and then you'll be able to reference that video as the week goes on and you'll be able to play that again the following month and the following month because it'll be the same show every month <laughs> so um yeah brian did you have anything else to add to that or uh, to oh just uh, yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to showing a live view as long as there's no clouds and we'll have that that up and going so we'll have dr coombs amazing images that he's he's taken plus hopefully a live view Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes. And I'm looking forward to that. I forgot to mention, you're going to be doing live views during the show and he's yes. going to share his photography with us during the show as well. Um, so yes. So yay, we did it. Woohoo! <laughs> if you enjoyed this show, let us know by leaving a comment and below, go ahead and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would love to be able to spend more time with you stargazing. Your job now is to go outside, look up and find something from tonight. We covered a lot of different objects you now have a handout with all your notes on it uh, if you didn't take notes you can just replay me over again and then you can take notes um, and so you'll be able to do that this is actually the last stargazing we're gonna be doing we're gonna take we've been going Kent how many months have we been doing this for this, this is 16th month. <laughs> so 16 months straight. And so we have many, many more. We're going to be doing, um, I will be showing uh, something in July just to keep the momentum going. But um, Kent and Brian and I are going to be taking a little bit of time off just to do our own stargazing. And then we'll come back and be uh, near the end of summer, early fall, and be able to share things that we've done over the summer with you as well. So I'm excited about that. So um, yeah, we will have something for um, July and August and I put together some presentations for you to enjoy as well. 
So, um, oh, and uh, we do, uh, Brian, you had a, some, did you have an announcement to make about the Central Coast, the, the website, or am I thinking of something else? Uh, let's see. No, I just, I do encourage everyone to definitely go and visit centralcoastastronomy.org. We often will post articles not only for upcoming events, but we do sometimes have articles that are posted from members, and we have lots of good resources. I recently added a new resource. If you're in the Central Coast area, one of our members gave us some good dark sky locations or darker <laughs> than in the city. So go definitely visit and follow us on Facebook as well. You could find us at Central Coast Astronomy on Facebook and then follow us there. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Brian, for every all your help tonight. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kent, for leading us on our tour of the night sky for the summer. And um, I thank you all for joining us. And if you would like to share this video with anyone, please do. This is a free resource. And don't forget your handout. You can download that for free as well. And we will see you for the next one. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, Kent. Bye, Brian.